Hey everybody, welcome on in for Live at Five. We are gonna do a broadcast tonight about warping. And I'm just gonna get all the folks on Instagram queued up for us. So that's not wanting to work for some reason tonight. Of course, we'll see if that comes on board. So um, this was supposed to be Wednesday scheduled broadcast, but as many of you know, that, where's your sound coming from, Kel? It's on the Facebook feed. Nick Kevin's got to kill the sound. He doesn't know where anything is. I'm not going to talk for a sec while Kevin figures out the sound issue. It's on this monitor right here. Can I turn the volume down via monitor? Hmm, I can't control it. I'm just going to wave at everybody for a minute with my bandaged hand. Hi, everybody. I'll, I'll turn the monitor off. He's fixing it. Hold on, everybody. I'm watching him figure this out. There we go. Okay, he fixed it. Whew. Shook the whole rig, though. Sorry, everybody. Sorry for the shaking. Hold on. Okay, good. All right, so happy Friday. Anyhow, as I was saying, this was supposed to be Wednesday's broadcast, but this has been a week. Uh, this has been a very, very challenging technology-wise week. We had our Good Morning Clay Share Monday morning uh, broad broadcast, which crashed on us, not due to us, but due to our internet provider. So we had to reschedule that, and we did that Tuesday morning. And then Wednesday, Tuesday I got my stitches out, so that went great. Wednesday, we were 15 minutes before the broadcast was supposed to start. I'm walking through the studio. I trip over the CAT6 cable that attaches our modem to our computer production gear and ripped it off the wall and broke it all. So no Wednesday, but good news is we have all the equipment back online. We've replaced, repaired, fixed everything, and we can do this broadcast. So we are going to be talking about warping and some tips and tricks I have for preventing warping. Now, I will start this out by saying, even I, after all these years of making pottery, still get plates that I follow all of these, these guidelines and they still will warp. It just happens sometimes. And who knows what I did different? Obviously, I don't because I wouldn't have done it, but warping does still sometimes happen. So, hey, everybody tuning in, I am doing great. I hope you are as as well. So uh, this is mostly for folks when we're talking about hand building, but we can address warping and wheel throwing because that happens as well. I find most warping for me happens with hand built plates that are longer than they are wide. So when we're making trays like this beautiful tray here, something like this, and if we look at it, you can see there's not any warping on it. And what I'm talking about for warping is the middle section will bow up sometimes. Sometimes the opposite will happen and the ends will bow up and the middle will stay down. Or sometimes the sides here will bow in, right? They'll pull in. So those are all drying and warping issues that you'll have. I never really see the sides bow out. And I don't know if you all ever, um, if you all ever get bowing outwards. I never get that though. So I use a mud tool number three yellow and number one red, yes. Um, so where do I get mine? Amazon sells them. Uh, did you try clayscapespottery.com? They might have those ribs. They're made by Cheryl Mud Tools. So just search them up. The red number three and the yellow number, yellow number three, red number one. So in Germany, it's almost time for sleep. Annette, oh no, well you get rest. You can watch the replay tomorrow. And here's, here's another one that I did. And you can see it's longer, but Again, the warping, you know, I have tricks for this, so it works out. Now, sometimes you might find warping on big plates like this right here. And what we usually get on these is possibly some rim undulations, right? So the rim might not be even all the way around. And a little bit of that is okay. These are handmade plates. So we can allow for a little small undulation, just a little bit. But when it's very noticeable, that's when it's a problem. 
The other thing that happens on large plates like this is we get slumping in the center where the span of clay is too wide to be supported by a single foot ring. So we have to add something else. Thus, I have done two, one here and one here. So it's a double foot ring. And that helps alleviate that issue with this slumping in the middle. I am moving my hand very well. I just want to let everybody know certain movements I can do very easily. I cannot grip or pull, can't open doors, can't pull things up or grip things very well, but I can gently lift things. Um, and I'm mostly using my left hand for everything. My right's just a guiding hand. So such as this large platter, which has yet to be glazed, and you'll notice that's a big span. We couldn't get that span without slumping if we didn't do two foot rings. And I do have classes um, making a large platter, I think it's a lace platter, where we do the double foot ring similar to this. I show you how to do that. Um, also in the baking tray class that I make, uh, that one shows you a double foot ring. You're working from home, don't tell your boss. I won't tell your boss. I won't tell. I won't say anything. So here's one that did warp, and I don't know if you can see it. Um, and this is the thing about warping. When it's very minor, you don't notice it, notice it very much. It has a slight bow right here, just very slight. But the ends sit flush, so the bowing really isn't noticeable um, unless you sit it on something and you look and you see just a more of a shadow line right here than everywhere else. So... Hi, Debbie. I had carpal tunnel surgery two weeks ago yesterday, and I had the stitches out yesterday. Everything's going well. It's all um, stitches out on Tuesday, actually. It's all going well. I'm recovering. This hand happens on the first, so I'll have two matching scars. Uh, so what I thought we would do is walk through a making. I can't actually make pottery. I don't have the all clear from my doctor. He won't let me, but I have some pieces that are in various stages of dryness, and I'm going to show you what I do to combat this, this warping issue. And I do talk about that in my plates class. And we'll talk about firing. That's another issue. We've made the pieces, no warping. They've dried. Everything's going great. We get to time to fire them in the kiln, and then we get warping, or worse yet, they crack, right? That happens. So um, this pattern is not. This was a piece of lace. That's what this one is. It's a, it's a lace doily. Um, this is actually a belated birthday gift. I made it. I made it before the person's birthday. I just have not been able to glaze it and finish it. And I can't say who it is because they could be watching, but their birthday's already passed. So now they know. <laughs> oh, gave it away. And so sometimes the firing can cause your pieces to warp um, and crack. And so we're just going to walk through the process from wet clay to dry clay to bisqueware and then glazed pieces. And we'll talk about ways we can fix all that. Surgery worked. I'm just going to tell anybody out there, and I know this isn't, this is clay related actually, and there'll be people like, will comment on this saying, well, we don't want to hear you talk about your surgery. Well, guess what? I have carpal tunnel because I've been making pots for 21 years, and that's what happened. But I'll tell you, I have needed this surgery for at least a couple years, but it started long ago, longer than that. I have hardly any pain in this hand, in the fingers. If you have carpal tunnel, you wake up with numbness and tingling and pain in your hand, pain in your arms. Um, guess what? I'm waking up with that on this side that didn't have the surgery yet, but not on this side. So if you're putting this off, don't. Go see your doctor and get this. You will be happier, you will work longer, you'll be pain-free, and you won't damage your nerves. And that's what happens. If you put this off, you get nerve damage. So this is one of the things that can happen from being a potter. It's part of the life. And, you know, when I first started all those years ago, I was like, that won't happen to me. I'll work smart and correctly. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter. You can work as carefully as you want. If you use your hands so much, this, this damage can happen. So luckily I had a great surgeon who could fix it. So please, please don't wait. So is there a big difference with warping with foot ring and feet? So I have a plate here with no foot ring at all. And we'll talk about the differences and why you might not want to do a foot ring on here. Now we're talking about feet like little nubs. Um, 
they, I have never done a plate with just little nubs for feet on a long skinny one like this. Uh, I've only ever done longer foot rings. So I haven't tried little nubs. Um, as long as you have support, like I would do, if I was gonna do foot, little foot nubs instead of a foot ring, so we're just calling like feet nubs, right? I would do one, two, three, four, five, six. I would put some in the middle for spanning this area for this one here. Yeah, just two weeks and that, it doesn't mean I can use my hand correctly. I still, it's still very stiff and the surgery is still healing. I have a giant scar under here that's still healing. But the fact that I'm already seeing results without pain and I have, my hands have been in pain for years. The last year has been miserable. You probably don't know, but it's almost to the point where I was crying every time I'd do anything. But I wouldn't show that. You guys wouldn't see that. Um, so now it's, it's, it'll be nice to be free of pain. I thought it would go away on its own. It won't. All right. So we're going to switch to the overhead and we're going to talk about when you're making pieces. Now, a lot of these pieces are made with GR pottery forms, which I love, but you can also make them with other forms. They don't have to be GR pottery, but the, the warping issues are the same, no matter how you make them, whether it's a GR pottery form, whether it's your own bisque form, whatever it is. So what I dry upside down, you just made it with nubs. So I'd be worried, Debbie, that upside down it would curl up a bit. I would still flip it over after it's leather hard. So here's a form, say we made our plate. Um, here's a plate I made already, it's been just drying. And so when you make your plates, you know, I like to leave them on the form overnight or till it's leather hard. I have found if I leave them on the form longer, GR pottery forms and other forms that are shaped like that, the piece will dry up off. And you'll notice that it's raised off the edge here. And that helps prevent warping of the rim. And it also helps with the bottom because it's already drying nice and evenly here. So we've got a good start. Another thing I wanna mention is when you're making plates with large rims and you're noticing warping on the rim here, like this is where your warping issue is, like they're not, it's, it's wobbling. What you wanna do is when you have it upside down, when you're making this, so let's pretend this is being made, you're compressing here against the board. You can actually see this is flat and then we have our side transition right here. And this compression against the board all the way around nice and evenly helps keep this rim nice and flat. And as it dries, it'll dry up off but it will prevent it from warping because compression has happened. And I, I do highly recommend when you are making your, your slab pieces, especially, that you always notice how I use that yellow rib and I compress my slab and smooth it out. I'm doing that for a very important reason. Um, it's to help all those clay particles align and to help it warp less. Believe it or not, that will help your piece to not warp down the line. So Arlene had her wrist done. Yeah, it, it is, it, it's gonna make a huge difference in my life. And I'm gonna get the other one done in two weeks. So it'll be, it'll be a few weeks of not, able to being, not being able to work, but it'll be worth it down the line. So once you've made your piece, so we have one here, and I have a, one here, these are, drying, right? This one, they're actually bone dry, but as soon as you make them and you flip them over and they are leather hard, you want to start preventing warping during the drying phase. So what I will do is I will cover them with plastic. So we'll drape this with a sheet of plastic. I don't have a sheet of plastic because you wouldn't be able to see through it. So just let's, let's pretend this is draped with plastic. And then I use these weight bags and you want to distribute them evenly. And actually what I will do is I usually put a third one in the middle because things like this try to bow up in the middle. Trays, platters, anything oval, oblong, they're trying to bow up in the center. So I'll put an extra one on top and that'll hold it down. And I leave these on until this is bone dry, completely 100% dry. 
So you have had very little warping after watching a video about compressing the clay. Exactly. And so when I show you how Stacy's right on it too, she knows. So when I make my pieces, I'm compressing in multiple directions with that rib, you know, and then as I'm forming it, I'm also compressing with a rib. And so all that compression is lining those particles to go into that shape that I want it to be. And that really helps. Now I found with trays, with plates, and this spherical triangle I have here, and other um, shapes that are not longer than they are wide, it works great, but I have still found things that are long and skinny, you, I have to weigh them down. They just will always, for me, they always tend to warp. And the warping issue that some folks are having where the sides are bowing up, again, you know, what you can do is when you put your weight bags on, you can position them in a way that they're right at the edge. See how that's right at the edge right here? That's right there. And I'll put them on just like that, all the way to the edge on the sides. But you have to make sure the piece is leather hard when you do this, because if it's not, it will it'll slump it, because it's too wet. It can't hold the weight. So, so the filling of these weights is kitty litter, clumping, uh, clumping kitty litter. This was a sleeve to a shirt, an old shirt of mine, a long sleeve t-shirt that I wore too many times in the studio. I cut the sleeves off, tied one end, filled, the other, filled it with kitty litter and tied up the other end. That's as easy as possible. No sewing at all on this. Um, this is another sleeve, same exact thing. I like filling them not all the way. Do you see we have some movement so I can shape them? I can actually shape them onto the pieces. You know, if you just wiggle the, the cat litter in there, like the sand, and it will shape it. Now, I did see a question, do I cover them with plastic overnight when I'm drying them? When I first make them? Yes, I do. Because my studio, I run a heater, and it would be way too dry. Yes, I do. Now, this one right here, this is a the front part of a t-shirt and the back part after you cut the sleeves off, cut it into that square, gather up the corners, pull them to the center, use a rubber band to hold it, and you've made another weight bag. These, this shape is perfect for circles or anything, um, hexagons, the smaller spherical triangles or spher spherical squares. This is good for that. So I use litter, you can use rice, you could use beans. Uh, beans sometimes leave a little dot, like sometimes they'll leave a little dimple almost from the bean shape. So you might not want to use beans. You could use lentils, they're smaller. But you want small things that you can have lots of to spread the weight out evenly. Kitty litter is good, but it is a sand-based product. So we are still um, you know, getting dust in the studio. And also, if you don't, if you don't put plastic over this and you put something like sand or kitty litter on your piece, the sand or kitty litter can embed itself into your, your plate. So you don't want that to happen. Does that make sense? You could use dry beans. Yeah, I would dry beans. I use clumping. I use clumping litter because that's what I buy for my cats. And that's what I had on hand the day. But you know what? You could use non-clumping. Non-clumping is bigger clumps. Um, I think when I started, I was using non-clumping. But at this point, I've remade these. I've had to add to them because, you know, they, they almost last forever, but not quite. Um, so you can use either clumping or non-clumping. I don't know which one's less dusty. I think they're about the same. So I'm trying to catch up on your comments. Make sure they don't have patterns on them because it can leave an impression in the clay. Oh, and you use knee-high socks. Knee-high socks would work perfectly. Yeah, this was just an old knit shirt. Um, actually, the shirt I'm wearing under this flannel right now, when this shirt gets too old for wearing, um, I'll cut the sleeves off this, under, this shirt I'm wearing right now. It'll become a weight bag. So you might have seen this shirt in videos years ago. Same thing with this now. Now this is too old. This one I made before, uh, I had this made before I was doing classes here. This was from before I lived here. Um, same with this one. So you won't see that one. But the purple one you might have. The magenta one you might have. 
So you have issues with the rims going wonky, Carrie, on your plates and everything. So the other thing about the rims going wonky, this one, if we look at our rim, we're in the overhead, and so you can see that rim is nice and even. I left this on, I made it in an evening broadcast. We made this actually in prime time a couple weeks ago. I left it on the form all that next day because I went for surgery and forgot about it. But when I got home that night, I took it off, but it was draped in plastic. Now, um, it was quite dry, but not too dry. Like it, it was okay, it wasn't bone dry, but it had dried quite a bit. And I flipped it out and I have found that letting them sit on the forms makes a huge difference. The only downside to that is it means your form is, is being used for a longer time drawing a piece than making a piece. So that's, that's an issue that some people have. So hopefully this will help some folks out there. So that's the making. And then we can talk about that foot issue. So when we look at a piece again, like this one, we did that double foot ring right there. And so that prevents that slumping. And when you're making it, you just add that extra foot ring on, that's all. For something like this, you might think you'd need to do two foot rings. Um, we do have a long span here. I let this dry for a long time on the form. Not, no longer than the other. I would say definitely overnight, like 12 hours. What I would do if I was concerned about slumping is I'd put a strip of clay here. So when I was making the foot, I would take another strip and just go right down the center, just right here, zoop, like that. And that would keep it from slumping in the middle. That would be just enough. You could go this way too if you want to, if you like the look of that. Yeah, Jennifer uses the, the non-clumping cheapest cat litter. It, yeah, whatever you can find, anything will work. So what would the bags weigh? I have them all different weights. Uh, this one here, uh, I would definitely say is about a pound and a half to two pounds. This one's a little more. This one might be closer to, to two and a half to two and three quarters. This one's about two on these bags. So I have them all sizes. I have them starting as little minis for small things all the way up to a bit bigger than this and longer for large platters. And you know, the, the key with the weight bags is when you put them on, you have to make sure your clay is not too wet for them. So you might flip your piece out off the form or off the mold, whatever you're using, and you might have to let it set for a few more hours before you can put the weight bags on them. You might not be able to go directly to the weight bag stage. You might have to wait for the weight bags. The thickness of the clay can be a factor in warping. Thinner, yeah, that's a good, that's a good comment, Elaine. Thinner pieces tend to warp more than thicker pieces. It's just how it is. Um, I have found if you make your pieces too, too thin, it's really a struggle with hand building, but it can be done. It's just, you really have to learn your clay and work very carefully. So that's why I work with like a, a mid thickness, like just the average thickness of a quarter of an inch when I'm rolling out my slabs. So if doing carving or Mishima, would I weigh before or after or both? Well, guess what? So say I was going to carve this plate that was just made, right? It comes off the form. It's probably still a little too wet for me to do anything with. So what I will do is I will cover it again with plastic, weigh it down, and then the next day come back to it, wax it. If I'm going to Mishima it, let the wax dry all the way, cover it with plastic and weigh it down another day, and then come back that fourth day after I made it, third day after I made it, making day, uh, uh, moving off the form and drying day, waxing day, f carving day. Yes, so four days after the day you made it, you can carve it. So it's a process. Same thing if I was putting some slipper under glaze for Sgraffito, I would let it air dry enough so that I could put the plastic back on it, weigh it down again, and leave it weighed down. Then after I've carved the piece, I will go back and weigh it until it's completely dry. Yeah, the weighing happens as long as I'm not working on it, it gets weighed down. Hope that answers that question. 
So can the middle foot be something tiny? Uh, it can be anything you want to have. Um, yeah, it can be anything you want to have in that middle. Now let's see, here's a bigger one I made and I just did a rectangle right here. But if you wanted to do just a strip like this and just have one strip here, you could do that if you want to do the whole length, if you want to divide this in half. Sometimes I divide this into thirds for the center. It just depends on, just depends how I'm feeling that day. I like the rectangle and the rectangle within a rectangle. Like I like that look, so that's why I did that. But with your pieces, yeah, you can just do a strip. But the key is make sure they're not too wet when you flip them over or they still can slump a bit, if that helps. So once you make your pieces and they're drying and everything's going great and then you come in the studio and you've weighed them down and you've done everything right and you've noticed your piece has a little bow in it in the center, right? So it's bowed up a little bit or it's a little wobbly. What can you do? Well, you got a couple options here. You could take one of these Brillo type pad sponges, get it wet and you can flip this over and you can, with this being wet, smooth down the two sides where it's wobbling a bit, right? You could do that and that will help even this up. So this is an after the fact warp issue. This is like fixing warping, right? You're gonna try to sand it down with this wet Brillo pad piece. The other thing you can do is you can get a board wet, a work board, and then as long as your work board is flat, you can then do this on it, right? You can just do in circles. And then you just keep checking it for a wobble. Now my, my work surface is not even. Everything wobbles on this. this. This countertop has warped itself. So I can't trust this. But if you had a nice level board, you can just check your corners. No wiggle wobble. You're good. So that will fix it. You might still have a tiny bit of a bow, but you won't have a visible wobble. And so that's the best way to do that. Um, and so this decal, uh, I see there's a question about it, is from Sambao Studios, that's chinaclayart.com. It's a lace one they have, and Sambao sent out, they're doing 20% off because of Inseca on their decals right now. I don't know what the code is. Go to their website and, and find out. Follow Sambao on Instagram. It's just S-A-N-B-A-O Studios. Find them and they'll take care of that. So you made the medium GR oval, and slip tried it, weighed it down, and bis fired, no warping. Then after glaze firing, it came out wonky. So we're gonna get to the next, next step. Um, so say you bisque fire and everything goes great. Bisque firing usually does go great. We don't usually have too much warping in bisque firing. Now, going back a bit to the making, um, as long as you compressed it really well onto the form, you shouldn't get any of those weird torquing warpings. So where the piece just for no reason twists itself a little bit. If you're getting those, you need to compress the form more. You need to compress the clay more when it is laying on the form, when you're making it. Because what's happening is that clay, all clay has a memory, and at some point you have moved their slab and given it a little twist, and when you drape it onto this piece here and you smooth it out, if you don't compress it well, then that twist is still in the clay's memory. You have to get that twist out. So you might have to work it a little more um, then, then you need to. You're not trying to crush it. You don't want to, you're not thinning it down and crushing it. You're just smoothing it very nicely onto the form. And that'll help create this new memory of whatever plate it's on. And so that's sometimes what happens is that torquing, and that will not show up until the glaze fire, sadly. You will be uh, just, you can go to the front. You'll be going along your merry way, making the piece, take it out of the bisque, glaze it, looks great, and then you glaze fire it and it comes out warped. That's one, one reason it can warp, is, is it's a previous memory. I know it's weird to think about something like clay in inanimate in, in, in material, right? It's clay, it doesn't move, having memory, but it does, it does. So, could you put an X in the middle? Yes, you could. Yep, yeah, so if you want, you can put anything you want for support doesn't matter on the bottom. You could do anything. It's entirely up to you. Uh, the key is to have a foot that will touch 
and that will keep it from slumping because you need that. And what can happen, slumping could be not even there through the bisque, but again in the glaze. And I've seen that before with plates, like, let me pull this one over here. Plates like this size, right? Looks great in the bisque, fabulous. You glaze it and you pull it out of your glaze kiln after it's done and the bottom here has slumped and touched your kiln shelf, right? This bottom that wasn't touching before, had plenty of room, slumped and touches your kiln shelf. And the best thing to do when you're making plates to alleviate that is to put an extra foot ring or if you want to do an X on the back of your plate, sure, to align this way, to align this way, just make sure they don't like go over each other, right? You'd have to cut, cut them so that they're all the same height. But you could do your foot ring any way you want. So can you rehydrate slightly in the beginning stage of slumping? Uh, you can try, but often trying to flatten it back out, it'll crack. I've never been able to. I've come in the studio, seen a piece that I forgot to weigh down, saw it bowing up, you know, wet it down a little bit, pressed on it, pressed down on it, thinking I could, and it just snaps. You can try. I, just like with everything, you can try it and see if it works. Um, it rarely does. It's really disappointing. I made this really cute platter a couple years ago, and I didn't weigh it down, and it, it totally totally worked. On the other hand, I have made plates, dinner plates, not quite as big as this, didn't cover them, nothing, didn't, didn't weigh them down, they completely dried fine because I was in a hurry, no warping, nothing. So a lot does depend on the form, I think, and I think plates are a form that are less likely to warp. It's just that, it's just that slumping in the middle. So you have extruded a 12 inch tray, the ends are curving up and the middle stuck to the board. Unstuck the tray, lightly spray the water covered and played some celadon glaze bottles to try to flatten. Might it work? It, think it might work. Oh, so you place some celadon glaze bottles on it to flatten it. It might work. It might, yeah. Try, only, only can try, right? And see what happens. How heavy could the bags be? Um, so what I like to do is I don't like to use one big bag for my platters. I like to use, as you can see, lots of little ones. Um, and these aren't even the ones, this one is one I would use on. And then I would use two more, just like this, right, on here so that they can span it evenly. And then I'd probably take a third and put it in the middle, um, like that. So there'd be another one here, and this one would be in the middle. Because that's the part that's going try to try to bow up on you. And I find it better to have multiple smaller bags than one great big bag. It just, I feel it works better. Plus they're more versatile. Um, I can use this in so many different things. If I have one great big one, I can only use it for one big thing. This could be three separate smaller pieces, right? Or one bigger piece. So that makes, it, makes a sense. So will it warp with porcelain? Um, porcelain does have more of a memory. So it is a little more prone to warping, but I may, I don't, I put everything away. I had a whole bunch of porcelain plates here earlier that I was sharing during Jeff um, from GR Pottery Forms little Ensika chat that I was on earlier. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. But, um, you know, I think with porcelain, it's the same thing. Compress really well, leave it on the form as long as it needs to be, flip it off when it's not too wet, and weigh it down, and, and through the process it should be all right should hopefully. So on uh, your new GR Pottery Forms you've got the rims are cracking at the seam between the rim and the middle from yes. So if you are getting cracking on your plates that you're making right here where the where the side meets the bottom is that what you're talking about right here where the rim meets the bottom that's because when it was upside down on the form you compressed too much right here. That's what it is too much compression, you thin the clay down there and it will crack because it's uneven, it's thinner in that area and it's gonna actually dry and fracture. And I've done that. When I first started using the WAS system from GR Pottery Forms, I compressed like crazy, not realizing I didn't need to. And I ended up with a whole bunch of circle plates. I ended up smoothing them down and just had flat, like cheese boards, basically. But, um, you know, just, don't compress so much right where that transition is. Compress more on the sides and on the top, but that transition, don't compress too hard there. 
So my bags have kitty litter in it, but you can put whatever you want. Doesn't matter. It will work. So after you have, you know, you got a nice form, you, you don't have a wobble going, everything's great, you're going to fire it in the kiln. Now, you want to make sure that the kiln shelves you're using are nice and flat. You know, a lot of times over you, a lot of, a lot of times as we use our, our kiln shelves, you'll notice they start to bow a bit. And because I put kiln wash on one side, my, my kiln shelves are only facing one direction. I don't flip them over, which could counteract the bowing, but for me, um, I don't want to risk any old kiln wash falling onto my pieces. So just make sure you have a nice flat kiln shelf for a bisque fire and for your glaze. And I will suggest never span your platters across two shelves. So when you're loading your kiln and you've got your shelves, make sure it's on one, not two, because that gap that can cause heating and cooling unevenness, which can cause warping. It could be, you know, one a little higher than the other, warping, and also issues for cracking. That's just setting yourself up for that piece to crack. You liked it when Kevin said porcelain holds a grudge. <laughs> exactly. He's right. Porcelain is, is, is kind of grumpy. So I do have a kiln shelf I grabbed to show you all. Let me go to the overhead. Why did it turn off? Can we turn it on? Let's see if we get that to come back on. Um, I did grab a kiln shelf because I thought we'd be doing this. Are you good? Yeah. And get it online. And when I bisque fire things, you know, depending on the size of the platter, it, I will either use a half shelf like this or I have whole shelves. So something like this one here, and I am doing everything one-handed because I'm trying, I'm really not going to use my right hand if I can help it. But a piece like this won't fit on one. So I have to use my full round shelves, and I have many of them so that I can stack them in. And kiln placement can affect, you know, warp, warping and cracking are two separate issues. I, I'm trying not to get into cracking tonight, but I kind of think it comes into it, right? It, it comes into it. You use the whole shelf for larger pieces, a half shelf for smaller pieces. Try not to span that gap, right? Now, you might not get warping, but you certainly can get cracking sometimes, and that can happen, one, if you're spanning a shelf, or two, if your, well, if your shelves are warped, or actually three, the piece is really big and needs some thing under it to help it move. And I, I talk about this, I think, in my cheese board class and in some of my other classes where we have large flat things. And we're going we're gonna to talk about flat things in a second. So these all have foot rings, and I'll walk you through the whole process with something without. So let's say we're going to fire this platter on a whole shelf, not a half. I just only have a half here. This is a pretty big piece, right? This is a big platter. Um, we got a lot going on here. We want to make sure that this heavy weight can expand and contract during the firing. And on its own, just on a shelf, most likely it's going to stick a bit and it's going to try to pull and it's going to break. Not so much in the bisque, but often in the glaze. So what I do is I use alumina hydrate in my kiln. I know some kiln manufacturers discourage this because they say it, it ages your elements. I run a kiln vent. I'm not really worried about that in my kiln. Um, I've been doing this my whole career. I've never seen it as a huge problem. But you could use silica sand or a fine or medium mesh grog. So alumina hydrate is just a base material we use in ceramics. You mix alumina hydrate with EPK, 50% of each, and now you've got kiln wash. So you can make your own kiln wash. So what you'll do is you'll scoop a little bit out, and this is just Oh, lid from a kitty litter container because, you know, kitty litter. And then using a brush, this is my alumina hydrate brush, I'm just going to brush this smooth everywhere that shelf is, everywhere that platter is going to be, right? Now that one, that one's too big. It won't fit on this shelf. So we're playing pretend, right? Because we don't, I don't have a whole shelf here. But you get the idea. Anywhere that that foot of that piece is going to touch, you're going to brush with this. Then when this after it's fired, right, 
Um, and I often will do this in the kiln. This piece will be, the shelf will be in the kiln. I will scoop this onto the shelf in the kiln and I use a brush. And the reason I use a brush, not my hand, is because you might not realize that you had a little glaze drip at some point and you might not see it. And you might be smoothing it with your hand and you'll run across that sharp glaze drip and it'll cut your finger. So I use an old brush that's designated for my alumina hydrate. So this is already in your kiln when you're doing this. And then after you fire it, so you put it on, of course it fits perfectly because it's a full shelf, right? And it fires, it cools, it's done. You have a beautiful platter, no cracks, yay. You have alumina hydrate left. All you do is you can do one of two things. You can take it outside and you can just brush it off into the wind by buy alumina hydrate, don't breathe it in as it goes. So do it, do it so it blows away from you or wear a mask, do both actually. Or you can brush this all up into a little pile and brush it into not your new alumina hydrate to contaminate it because we might use this in glaze manufacturing, but get a separate little jar, call it alumina hydrate used, right? Or four kiln shelves only or whatever the material is you're gonna use. Save it, um, brush it over and brush it into your little container. And that way you're saving it and you got it. What if the foot is a platter on the whole half shelf but the rim hangs over, is that okay? So the rim can hang over. The only issue you can have is, and we'll talk, let's talk about that. So we have a platter here, you put it on and let's say, you can see that clearly. This part is all, this part of the platter rim is all on the shelf. This, the foot, let's pretend the foot is on the shelf, but the rim is hanging over. So as the kiln's heating and cooling and that hot air is moving around your kiln, because it is, as it comes up here, it's coming up along the side. It's not touching the rim really a little bit, but when it comes up here, it's hitting your rim and then kind of going around your rim. So the way the air currents are, more heat is in a way coming in contact with this part of your rim. So if you unload it and you notice this rim has warped and this one didn't, that's because it's hanging over. So what I suggest, and it might not be a problem, but what I suggest is the next time you fire a piece, mark down, write it down or just make a mental note. If, if you don't forget like me, I forget everything. Make a mental note, oh, right side of platter was hanging over shelf. When you unload it, right side of platter warped. I would guess that's because it was hanging over the shelf. If you're doing it and not getting warping, don't worry, right? So that is really, really helpful. Yes, Judy adds the alumina hydrate to her wax because it helps the foot move and it prevents plucking too. And she's right, that is a great tip. To, we call it um, lid wax when we do that to it. But now, say, you've gotten to your bisque fire, everything's seemingly okay, but you realize you got some warping and you wanna sand those feet down now, what can you do? Well, don't worry, you can still sand it down, but you gotta use, you can't use that little Brillo pad anymore, that's not enough, let me scoot this out of the way. So, you need to use something a little hardier, and I would use a grinding disc of some sort and what you do is you put this on your wheel, get everything wet, and then you grind and grind your edges. It's easier to do this at the bisque stage than wait till it's glaze fired and do it because the clay, when it's bisque, you can grind it easier than when it's fully vitrified glaze fired pieces. So I would grind it now, and that's only if you get a wobble, like you're noticing wobbles on your piece. Um, if you're getting a, just a bowing in the middle, if it's not wobbling, that's just an aesthetic issue and you really can't grind enough off to make it look good. So I would let it be. Then after you glaze fire, if you notice there's still a wobble, you can put it back on the wheel and you can, you can grind it back down. And you can use these diamond grinding discs from Diamond Core Tools. You can use uh, a Dremel tool attachment and grind it down. You could do it by hand if you've got time and patience and you can grind it all down. It'll work, it'll be fine. So what if you have half shelves and you want to do a big platter? Uh, um, 
you can try it, but it probably will cause some issues. My suggestion is to say invest in a big big shelf. Yeah, that's the that's what I ended up having to do when as I upscaled my work over the years and I started making bigger and bigger pieces, I needed to have a shelf that would be big enough for my pots. So, um, you know, start with just one. It's a, and you know what I ended up doing with my first full shelf? When I bought my kiln, it came with one full shelf as the bottom shelf. So what I did is I took that full shelf out of the bottom, replaced it with half shelves, and then I used that full shelf for my platters. And I could only do one big platter at a time. Um, so let's go to this. We'll talk about this piece now. So now we're going to talk a minute about pieces. I got all kinds of alumina hydrate and stuff on my foot here. Where do I get alumina hydrate? Um, so alumina hydrate is, I don't know what it's scientific, it's little uh, periodic table of the elements abbreviation is for AL. I don't know what hydrate is. Alumina would be AL. I don't know what hydrate. Someone else might, maybe it's AL. Is it hydrate 2? No. So we'll find that out. We'll get that for you. But it's called alumina hydrate is the, the raw material. Would I put a platter on the bottom shelf or very top shelf? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda, because I wanted to, to talk about where you put your platters in the kiln. All right. So we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the no foot one after then. So where should we put our platters in our kiln? Well, you want to put it where it is the most even firing. So if, and this is going to depend on your kiln. So you have to know your kiln. If you have a kiln that the bottom heats up or cools really fast, like if the bottom of your kiln is where all the, it cools so, so fast and it's always colder, I would not put it in the bottom. If you have a kiln that's hotter on the top, and it heats up really fast and probably cools really fast, I wouldn't put it there either. I'd put it somewhere in the middle. So you have to be a little more creative when you're stacking and loading your kiln, making sure that your half shelves are even until you get to the place where you put your full shelf, right? Now, the kiln, I, I used to run a Scut kiln. I love Scut, they're a great brand. Almost, I feel like kilns are, are pretty even across the board. Some kilns have some features, other kilns have other features. You just pick the features you like the best. Uh, with my scut kiln, every time I fired a platter on the bottom shelf, it cracked. Now, I did not have a kiln vent um, in that kiln, and I don't know if that made a difference or not, but my kiln always was much cooler on the bottom. It cooled too fast. Once I started moving my platters off the bottom shelf in that kiln, I got no more cracking. I could fire in the middle. I could fire it on the top. They didn't crack. But that bottom shelf in my scut, without a vent, cracked every single time. Now I have an L&L &L with a vent, so it's a different kiln and has a vent, so it's a totally different creature, really. Um, it fires very evenly. I fire platters on the bottom without a problem. I fire them in the middle without a problem, and I fire them on the top. So my kiln is firing great. I can put it anywhere in my kiln, but you must know your kiln. Also, if you put your platter on the top and you like to peek, at your pieces as it's cooling because you can't wait because we all get excited and we want to see. If your kiln's not down below like 125 and you open that lid to peek in, that colder air will rush in across your platter even if your platter is further down because you can't wait that cold air is going in, especially if it's further down and mixes with the warm air, that shock of cold air is going to potentially crack your piece. Think about it. A mug sits on a shelf. Are we in the front? Yeah. Okay. So a mug I have a mug. I have a cup. I do have a mug. So a mug is sitting on a shelf, and it's heating up and it's cooling down, and the only surface that's directly touching your kiln shelf is the bottom of this cup or mug, right? So this is getting the most heat uh, as far as longest exposure to heat. So when this is cooling down in the cooling cycle after it's fired, you know, up here's cooling, down here's cooling, the last area to cool will be what's touching the shelf because the shelf retains a lot of heat. Now let's move to a platter, right? Platters have a much bigger area. And although only the foot ring is actually technically touching the shelf, this bottom is right there, so it's as hot. So this part here is incredibly hot, longer than something like a cup. So this whole surface, this whole big hot area, it needs to cool nice and slowly because if we rush it, it will crack. It's a huge area. Think about it. Look at the space difference. Look at the difference. 
you have a little tiny cup bottom, you could probably pull this at 150 and be fine. Peak all day, doesn't matter. Big platters, you got this giant area. Now, I use B-Mix, which is a very fine clay. If you use a groggy clay, if you use a B-Mix or a porcelain like me, very fine clays are more temperamental to heat shock, thermal shock. Groggy clays with lots of sand or grog in it, you can get away with more things. So maybe you use a groggy clay. You don't put alumina hydrate on. You span two shelves and you open your kiln really early and it's all fine. Great, that works for you. You're doing fabulous, you don't need any of this. But if you're using a B-Mix or a finer clay, you might be having some of these problems. I'm just giving you some tips. So no peaking, I know it's so hard, it's so hard. So does the vent make a difference if you move the full shelf to the middle? Um, I haven't seen it make a difference, no. I did it on my L&L, &L. Um, when I first got it, I still only had one full shelf and I moved it up. And so I didn't notice a difference. No, you'll be fine. Just put your two half shelves in that bottom and you'll be all good, Valerie, no problem. So one of your favorite pieces you add was a thin rectangle dish. You put four feet on it and it warped in the center and now it looks like the greatest su sushi serving platter ever. Is it okay to use if it was warped? Yeah, it worked. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about what you did. That platter warped because the clay memory came out, right? That's what it was. And so you've got this fabulous sushi platter you didn't expect to have. Can you replicate it? Probably. Try it again and see if you get there. But is it safe to use? Absolutely. Yeah, just being warped. Warped pieces, food tastes just as good off of them. Don't worry about that. So this is for bisque and for glaze, I would suggest, yes, yeah. Um, bisque pieces can take more thermal shock because they're not fully fired, so they're not vitrified. That means they aren't sealed up and they don't have that thin layer of glass, which is what glaze is, right? So could you get away with cooling a little faster in a bisque? Yeah, you can, you can. Um, you can cool it faster and peak a little sooner in a bisque than a glaze, yes. Uh, when I know it's a whole bunch of platters, I try not to. I try to be really good. I try to wait till it's room temperature. I mean, honestly, when I am doing a glaze load of platters, I wait till room temperature. I, because my studio can be 45 degrees. I am not opening up, that's a huge temperature difference. I'm not opening up that kiln to the air at 45 degrees when the kiln's 125. So I wait till room temperature. I mean, if I show up in the studio and it's 45 degrees, I'm putting that heat on as high as I can get it. <laughs> and try to get it closer to 60, it'll be nicer. So should you always put a large platter in the middle to be sure? Anna, Anna, that's the safest place to put it. The only issue you can sometimes have is the platter's so big that you can't use posts to put it up any higher. If I have to pick between only the bottom or only the top for loading a platter, I would say top if I was gonna pick because heat rises, so your heat is gonna the top's going to cool last. So that's the place that as long as you let the kiln cool to room temperature, you should be okay. But that's where you're at greatest risk of peaking, right? So don't peak. That's, that's my, my lesson for today. Don't peak. I know we weren't going to talk just about warping, but what about when kiln posts are not perfectly level so the shelves don't rest perfectly on them? It seems okay with half shelves with a full shelf. Right. So you want to try, it does make sense. It does make sense, Allie. So she's asking what if the posts, you know, kiln posts wear and they sometimes can be a little rocky and with a half shelf, you can kind of get away with it. But with a full shelf, it's a bit of a concern if it's unstable. So what I try to do is I just keep looking through my posts and see if I got some that will work. Sometimes I turn my kiln posts on their sides. That works. Sometimes they're so far off, I have to use a bit of kiln shelf a broken piece of kiln shelf in there. I mean, any little thing you can find to prop it up will work to get them about even. But try to get them as even as possible. Little shards of broken kiln posts, you know, uh, kiln shelves. Sometimes when the shelves break and you get those little tiny nubby pieces you don't know what to do with, save them in a little jar. Those will work. Prop it up, get it even, you're good to go. So let's talk about the flat pieces. So say you make something uh, without a foot ring, right? Which you might. Foot ring or no foot ring, they still, they still tend to warp. So if you do a platter without a foot ring, how it's gonna warp is it's gonna bow up, 
just like the ones with the foot ring. So what I do is I make my plate. This was made with a Jarrah pottery form. You can see it's one of the longer than it is wide, so we're at risk for warping. These are ginkgo biloba leaves. I pressed into the clay, but not very hard, and then I brushed under glaze, black speedball under glaze on it, and then I peeled it off, and so I had this really great pattern, draped it over a GR pottery form, made my little tray, and then popped it out, put it on a wear board. After it dried a little bit, I covered it with plastic, and then probably, I probably used two, I probably used that one, and probably used two smaller ones than this, but I just weighed it down till it was completely dry. Now this one is small enough that I wouldn't be worried about, one, it fits on a half shelf, and I, I don't worry about alumina hydrate on this particular size. This is a small, fairly light platter, so I wouldn't worry about it. If it was thicker, I would worry, but it's not. So we don't need the alumina hydrate. Can you use the alumina on advancer shelves? I, I don't know. Check with advancer. They have great tech support. Check with them. Um, I've, I've never used their shelves. Advancer makes some really great thin shelves. And I'm just not familiar enough with them to answer that question. Okay, <laughs> maybe we can change the kiln lids for windows. Amy, I like that. I like that idea. If you peek, you might hear pings later, Patty says. Right, and so if you hear pinging, you know, um, sadly, that's, that's some, some cooling issues, right? Yeah, put it back on front. The, the overhead just said no. So I have got a bunch of plates and platters that I was going to share with you that were made with all with the, the same way, you know, weighing them down, foot rings on them. You don't have to put foot rings. Uh, I love the look of a foot ring. I like how it raises pieces up. Um, I also like it because it lets me do a little glazing on the bottom. When we don't have a foot ring with stoneware, mid-range firing pieces, we can't glaze the bottom. Those of you who are making earthenware pieces, low fire, you know you glaze the bottom and you fire them on stilts. But, and again, it's totally different if you're doing earthenware too, right? Because you can glaze the bottoms and then you're firing it on stilts. And lower fire clays are less likely to crack in firing and less likely to warp. That's just how it is. So if you're using earthenwares, um, the chances are you're not going to have the same warping or cracking issues that we have with stoneware, mid-range, or high fire pieces. Oh, Kevin's going to respond to Michael's question, but it's a it's a good one. Um, you can can you you can sand kiln show posts? Yes, you can sand your kiln post with a belt sander. You can sand your kiln post with anything. Um, so here's another one I made, and I decided to put it on the vertical because the way I put the texture in, it's a vertical. Um, I'll hold it sideways. You can see more of it. So this is my succulent pattern. It's so cute. And then I signed it vertical because it's vertical. Um, but, you know, we don't have to worry about a center support in things that are this small. We're good. It's just when we get to those bigger pieces, um, you know, like this, this size here, still again, we don't need that center support. We have a nice, nice flat rim. This, this actually, when I made it, you can actually tell, look, see this touched the board. You can tell because it's flat right there. This touched the board when I was making it and I smoothed it down. And I do believe if we look, do you see how straight it is without warping? I think a lot of the reason pieces warp is they're not compressed correctly. Now I press down, don't press in because if you press any clay up under, it can catch and then it won't um, dry and shrink off the form correctly. It can catch and crack. How long and what temp do I recommend when leaving peepholes open and how many would you leave open? You have four. So Lucy, I would do the second one from the top and your very bottom one. That's the ones that I do when I used to do it that way. And I would leave my peepholes open until about 1,000 degrees. And then I put somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200. I try to catch it and plug it up then if you don't have a vent and that's how you're venting it. And so here's one that I, I don't know if you can see. I think you can see the warp on this side just a little bit. Do you see the, I'm trying to hold it. Can you see it? You see a slight warp? This is the one 
right here, there's a tiny, tiny, there you see it? Tiny bit of warp. But it's the kind of warp that I know is there, but nobody else will know. Uh, because I sanded the bottom a little bit so it didn't wobble. So hopefully that helps. You made an egg tray, glaze fired, and the kiln was cold, and the egg tray is broken. So you glaze fired it. Did you wait? Did you put anything on your shelf to help for movement? Um, egg trays are kind of heavy. Here's one. E egg trays are very heavy. You see the back? Um, when I fire them, I put a little lumina hydrate under that foot ring so it can move. Um, the other thing is make sure your kiln shelves are nice and flat. If you have any warping at all on your, or cupping on your kiln shelves, it's going to affect your piece because your piece is going to sink down with it or try to, and that can crack it. So see if that helped, um, if that helps you with that. So that's very disappointing because you put all that time and work into an egg tray and then for it to crack. That, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. Illumina hydrate is A L parentheses O H three. You're shaking your head <laughs> like I can see you. I can totally see you. You're gar learn are you geared up to learn how to fire your 1827G Olympic gas kiln? Woohoo! You fired three glaze and three bisque loads. Very exciting. Going to cone ten. Woo! Burners on the bottom. Okay. Yep. So you have like mine, I have an updraft kiln with an uh, arch on the top so that it's actually very efficient. Your burners come up through the bottom, they hit the top, they loop back down, they come back around before going back out. So actually they come up the center and they go out the sides and then back up and out the top. So it's pretty cool actually. Gas kilns are awesome. So if you're firing a large stoneware ply or cone seven, can you glaze the bottom and fire in stilts? It will warp. No. When you go that hot, cone 7, your pieces are going to start to slump and sag. I mean, you might be using a cone 10 clay, which you probably can get away with very little slumping at, if it's a cone 10 clay fired to cone 7, but your platter won't be vitrified. Um, but if you glaze both sides, it's food safe. So what I'm going to say is you made the platter. Do a test as long as you're okay with it possibly slumping and being slumped, but it might not. Uh, if it was B-Mix that you used, don't do that. I'm just gonna say, anybody out there watching that uses B-Mix, don't fire to cone seven with, with um, B-Mix five, mind you, because there's a 10, I keep forgetting. Um, don't fire with stilts because it could slump on you and then you'd be unhappy. Ah, so Rich says, a bit off topic, do you need to worry about your big heavy vases moving and cracking like that? You don't, Rich, and that's because the surface area on the bottom of vases are like that cup. It's much smaller. You know, when we're talking platters, we have a surface area of this whole, whole bottom. Now, if you were making large sculptural pieces that had great big bottoms like this, I would put some down, yeah. But I think for your vase, you shouldn't have to. I mean, you can always put some down if you're really, really worried, but I don't think you'll have a problem. It's those large, flat things. Because when we fire things in the kiln, you know, it has expansion and then it contracts. The piece actually physically expands. I don't know if you all know this, but in the firing process, there's a chemical change and a physical change. The clay actually expands and the piece gets a little bit bigger during firing and as it cools, it contracts. It's like something when it's hot versus cold. You know, ice expands and contracts, right? So it's the same thing. This piece expands and then it contracts. So if it doesn't have space to move, it's gonna, it's gonna find space. It's gonna go to the weakest point. And that's probably your sides of your platter or plate and it will crack there. So and to answer Rich, I think you'll be fine. I have never used alumina hydrate for vases or anything. But make sure it's all the way dry and you better do a six hour preheat on that beautiful big vase. I'm just saying, better to do a six hour preheat than rush and have it blow up because I don't want that to happen to you. So you have cone six and cone five clay. Can you fire them together? If so, to which temp? Linda, you can fire them together. Uh, I do a cone five and it's fine. You can do cone six at cone five. Some people might say that's not okay, but Really, it'll be okay. 
it makes sense. It does. It, when you know about it, it makes sense. Because uh, I think it's just the fact that we don't know. Until I knew that that happened, uh, I didn't. I mean, until I knew it, why would I even consider that being a thing that happens with clay? When do I use the Jarrah Pottery form uh, spacers? When I want it deeper. So I used it on this one right here because I wanted a deeper form. I used it on this one here to get a little bit more raised piece. And so that's why I use them when I want a larger, um, deeper form. That's all. Uh, I used it on this one too. You can tell. Do you see how much deeper this is than a regular? It's a, it's a little deeper. And so when you make it, you just put them under. And so that gives you more of a slope down the side. So you get that depth to it. Yes, ma'am. Good. I'm glad it makes sense. Okay. Sand under the plates. Yeah, you can put sa silica sand under plates or platters if you need to. Yes. Yes, you so can. Um, this plate, I think I did alumina hydrate under it just as a precaution. I might not needed to, but I did. Um, it's a big plate. I don't, I don't want it to break. So a little alumina hydrate in there isn't a big deal. Just, you know, when you're done, you take your shelf out and you, you either recycle it or you dispose of it. Just brush it off. Don't breathe it. Wear your mask. Does anyone use B-Mix 5 on advanced shelves without kiln wash? You need kiln wash with porcelain and B-Mix 5 is porcelain like, right, B-Mix 5 is a porcelain a stoneware. And that's what all the clay you see right here is. Because um, what happens is, in porcelain and porcelain stoneware, the clay starts to vitrify sooner, turning more into like a glass substance, and it can actually bond to the kiln shelf and pull chunks of it off, and that's called plucking. Um, hopefully somebody will answer that for you about Advancer, Diane. If they don't, reach out to Advancer, and I'm sure they'll be happy to, to answer. Do I know the finished outside dimensions of my egg putter? Well, huh. Uh, no, but we can find out together with this tape measure. So this is the one from my class. Finished outside dimension is uh, just under 13 inches long by nine inches wide. So nine by 13, basically, for that egg tray. Is it ever, is it okay to stack on top of a plate in the bisque? You can. Um, but you got to be careful not putting too much weight on a plate. Like you could put two plates. Um, so say I was bisque firing this plate and I had this little tray. I can't pick that up. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I can hold this and I won't put it in. Say you're going to put these together and bisque fire them together. Yeah, you'd be okay to do a couple things. But what happens if you do a big stack of pieces, all that weight is weighing down that bottom piece. What can happen is that bottom piece can crack on you and the others can be fine. So when I do what's called tumble stacking, that's when we, we put multiple pieces on each other, I try not to put more than one other piece on each other. But what I do is when I'm doing lots of little small things like jewelry, that is a bisque fire, I fire them in cups or plates. Or little magnets, I always stack them in plates and cups because you can put as many as you want in there and it'll be fine. B mixed with grog is still like porcelain because the base is still a porcelainous clay, but the addition of, of grog changes it and makes it more open. So it doesn't, yeah, it's not the same. It, it's not gonna act the same. It, that opening of the clay changes it. So I think we are over time, aren't we? My, my time minder wasn't on me. Yeah, we'll That's why we can't have pieces touch in case they expand or they're fine. Exactly. How much does the clay expand? It's very small, um, micro, microscopically small. It, it's just a little bit. Um, if you guys want to know more about that, silica expansion is what it's called. And it actually turns from like a silica beta to alpha. It, you know, I think it goes from alpha to beta and then back again. But if you want to know more about that, you can look it up or I'll even do a little talk if you want to get more into that really deep tech stuff. Um, I don't usually go over that in, you know, I used to go over in my class in advanced ceramics, but I don't usually go in that here. But we can if you guys want it. All right, so sorry I went over time a little bit. I got a couple announcements. Um, one, Kevin Kowalski's part two of his workshop 
Mocha Diffusion is happening this Saturday. If you haven't signed up yet, come, come hang out with us and do some Mocha Diffusion. We also have a really great hand-building workshop coming up in April, a three-parter with Maria Sampson. She's going to teach you how to make garden sculptures, stacking garden sculptures. Very nice. Premium members always get 20% off ClayShare workshops. So please go to ClayShare.com and under forums, look up the workshop discounts and use those discounts so you save. If you signed up, you can let us know and we can fix it for you too. So um, the other thing I want to let you know is when you sign up for our workshops, you have them forever. Whether you are a premium member or not does not matter. Uh, so you don't have to be a member of ClayShare to take our workshops. Anybody can do it and you can have them always forever and ever and ever, which is fabulous. Um, the other thing we have coming up, let's see, in prime time next, we're going to do the ClayShare March mid-month check-in for the challenge. And I am in an exhibition from it, by this fabulous organization. It's 50 Women in Ceramics. And their Facebook page is really where everything's happening. And the exhibition is called The Personal is Universal. And you go to their Facebook page, which I think we're going to share the link, and you can vote on your favorite piece. And the jurors are going to pick their favorite piece, but there is a best of, sh best of show for, for the people's choice. So the one you all like the best. And I have one of my soldier plates. It's called Chris, C-H-R-Y-S. Um, that piece is in the show. If you click like, I get one vote. If you click love, three votes, three. So if you've already gone and voted for my piece, thank you very much. If you click like, thank you. If you click love, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you did like it and you want to go back and love it, you can do that and add those extra two votes onto my piece. So check that out and please vote for my, my work. And if you want to know more about my work, the link to my, um, my art page is on there. So something separate from Clayshare. So thank you, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful evening. We'll be back next week. I, depending on what the okay is from my doctor, I might be doing some glazing next week. So we will see. I don't know yet. We'll have to ask my doctor nicely. <laughs> All right, everyone. Take care. Have a great night. Premium members.